All right, let's start with this. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today and welcome to Vibes. Today, we are very excited to have Jonathan De Quitt from the Institute for International Economic Studies in Stockholm. Jonathan will tell us about implicit preferences inferred from choice, which is joint work with Tom Cunningham. Quick reminder about the logistics before we start. We'll have 45 minutes of presentation followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. During the talk, questions will be limited to clarifying questions and you can ask them in the chat. Tom will be connected and might answer a few of them. And during the Q&A, you'll be able to ask your questions directly. That's all on my part. Thank you, Jonathan, for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me and thanks everyone for being here. Um, so this paper is, we've had a working paper in circulation for some time, but uh, we're very excited to show you uh, we've been making a bunch of changes in recent months and uh, uh, yeah, looking forward to hearing your thoughts. So I'd like to begin with a thought experiment. I'd like to imagine that you see a hiring manager making hiring decisions and they look like this. So they, they're looking at candidates and the candidates differ in two respects, in their gender and their qualification, which can be an MBA or a PhD. And what you see is that when the candidates have the same qualification, this manager chooses female candidates. That's these vertical choices here. But when the candidates have different qualifications, they choose male candidates. That's these diagonal ones here. So obviously I don't need to tell you that these choices are not consistent with any utility function defined over gender and qualification of the candidates because they're intransitive. It's an intransitive cycle. But we think that there's an intuitive conflict here going on between two motives. We see pro-female choices in these blue vertical choice sets, and we see pro-male choices in these orange diagonal choice sets. And this intuition is what we're going to be carrying through the talk, this idea that there are kind of in more direct choices, you might exhibit one set of preferences, and in more indirect choices, you might exhibit a different set of preferences. So what are we going to do? We're going to basically say that this uh, hiring manager is exhibiting two types of preferences, an explicit preference that's pro-female and an implicit preference that's pro-male. And we're going to be very precise about what we mean. But uh, intuitively, uh, the, the terminology we're going to use is opacity. We're going to say that these diagonal comparisons are more opaque. They reveal less about preferences over gender than the vertical comparisons. And we're going to define an implicit preference as one that becomes stronger in more opaque comparisons. So that's the intuition of the talk. And most of what I'm going to be saying from here on is going to be adding kind of flesh to that idea. So just some more examples. This idea is not just about discrimination, uh, but we can think about implicit preferences in all kinds of domains. So this diagram here would be a, a case of considering consumption. So preferences over uh, going to see movies. And this, these choices would reveal an implicit preference for comedies, but an explicit preference for documentaries. These choices would reveal an implicit preference for uh, consumption today, but an explicit preference for, for patients for choosing to defer consumption to tomorrow. These choices would reveal an implicit preference for positively framed gambles, but an explicit preference that's indifferent over gamble framing. So in a direct choice, you're indifferent, but in, the, in these kind of opaque and direct choices, you choose positively framed gambles over negatively framed gambles. And finally, these choices would, uh, would reveal an implicit preference that favors yourself. So you choose uh, a mug or a cash for yourself over something for someone else, but in direct choices, you favor the other person. And we'll actually, at the end of the talk, we'll see an experimental example that comes from Christine Exley, which has exactly this structure. So uh, why do we think this is an intuitive idea? Well, actually, because we see it arise in multiple different literatures and multiple different types of theory of motivation. So there's a class of models of kind of signaling theories where there's a trade-off between your intrinsic preferences over something and then the reputation that you might gain from how you choose. And then there's another class of theories which we'll call cognitive theories where there's a kind of conflict between your conscious and your unconscious or your system two and your system one judgments. And there's another class of theories which we'll call rule-based where you might have some preferences but they perhaps conflict with choices that you can justify or that you think are rationalizable. Uh, we threw a few citations on the right here but there's many more papers that fall into these classes 
And what we think is interesting here, uh, we're going to so we're going to group these essentially into these two categories of explicit and implicit. And what we think is interesting is that there's kind of diverse underlying foundations in these literatures. They're, they're not the same mechanism that's driving choices, but the behavioral patterns end up looking. Je dans la chambre, je dans 40 minutes. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so the diverse underlying foundations, but the algorithm that we can use to detect these patterns of choice are going to look very similar. So what are we going to do in this paper? We're going to present a behavioral model of implicit preferences. That is, implicit preferences are something we can observe directly in decisions. And that's going to be in contrast to what you might be familiar with, this notion of implicit association tests and other approaches that use non-choice data. We're going to purely look at decisions and say that we can back out what are the implicit preferences or the implicit associations or the implicit uh, biases that are revealed in those choices. And we want you to think of this as something kind of abstract, think of something like analogous to an elasticity or a complementarity. It's a feature of preferences that in more opaque choices, they shift in a certain direction, and that's what we're going to call an implicit. Uh, and I'm going to, I'm not going to show in great detail, but we're going to give a hint as to how we think you can derive these, this kind of abstract property from diverse underlying foundations. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to basically walk through this diagram. Uh, so at the top of the, these foundations, I'm going to very quickly give you intuition for why three different types of uh, model can give rise to very similar intuitive patterns of behavior. Then at the heart of the talk will be the model, this, this model which we call separable implicit preferences, which is where we kind of define this notion of an implicit preference and, and characterize what it looks like. And then I'll take you down one branch where we show how to identify implicit preferences in one type of data, which is going to be called joint evaluation data. And we're going to have an application to racial bias. Uh, and then we're going to take it down another branch, looking at uh, data from binary choices. And then we'll use a different application to look at implicit risk and social preferences. So foundations, and this is going to be very quick. I'm just going to give you a flavor of, of, of these, what's going on here. So a signaling model would be one in which you care about what you choose, but also what your choice signals to, to, to somebody else. And there are some models in which that observer is an outside person or society. Uh, and there's, there are other models in which that observer is yourself. So you're signaling to your future self, you're imagining you might look back and, and evaluate the choices that you made in the past. So formally preferences here are defined over the, kind of the, the bundles, the objects that you choose, but also over the beliefs of the observer and you care about what they think. Uh, and in the model, we are going to assume there's an observer who has independent Gaussian priors over the, the values of the different attributes of the objects that you're considering. So why would that give rise to this intransitive cycle? Uh, this is a person who truly prefers men. They would like to hire men. But they don't want the observer to realize that. They want the observer to think they prefer women. Well, in these vertical choices, it's very clear what's your motive. If you pick a man, it's because you prefer a man. Whereas in the diagonal choices, gender is mixed with the qualification and the, the observer can't, can't exactly figure out what it is that's driving your choice. And that kind of gives you permission or gives you an excuse to, to pick the men. So that's, that's a signaling intuition. And I'll often call on this intuition when showing you pictures later in the talk, because it's quite intuitive how, how this gives rise to the pattern. But there are other models that can give the same pattern. So this is a model of implicit knowledge, or you can think of implicit associations. And it says that your decisions are influenced by kind of unconscious associations that you hold. So stereotypes that you hold about men and women. Uh, and sometimes those are useful and sometimes they're misleading. And the way the model works is it's a two systems model of cognition. So these associations are embedded in system one and system one sends, sends messages to system two, but not doesn't tell it exactly what the associate, associations are. System two has to try to figure out what to do. And there are some choices where system two can figure out what the associations were. And there are some choices where system two cannot. And it depends on the structure of the objects that you're considering. So this is a setting in which the male candidate gives you a good feeling, but you don't know exactly why. In these vertical, yes. So maybe this is a good moment to ask you a question that Colin Cameron asked in the chat. Yes. He says that implicit versus explicit in psychology usually means declarative versus non-declarative. That is what people say versus what people know or won't say. Um, maybe because they cannot say it. 
And that was, right. for example, the motivation in implicit association test. Right. So do you think that uh, this uh, slide of yours speaks to the kind of distinction from psychology? Uh, maybe, I mean, I think all of them have this notion that there's, that, that this is the choice, this is the preference that you would say. I would say I prefer women, but I might reveal uh, indirectly that I prefer men. And here, you know, again, this is a setting where I might know or I might think or I might explicitly say that I prefer women, but I also have this good feeling about men and I don't know exactly where that's coming from. So I think it, it's capturing that notion and it, it's gonna be in different ways depending on the foundation we're looking at. Okay, thanks. Um, Right, so here you have this good feeling about the male candidates. You don't know exactly why. In the vertical choices, you can figure it out. You can see, well, I have a good feeling about him. The only thing that's special about him is that he's a man and I want to override that because uh, explicitly I prefer women. Whereas in the diagonal choices, that's not the case. I have a good feeling about the man and I don't know exactly what's driving it. Maybe it's his gender, maybe it's his qualification. And because those good feelings are often informative, I might go with it. So this is a model in which these cycles can actually be rational in the sense that you are making a decision based off of, of informative uh, associations that you hold. The final model is very simple. It's an example of a rule-based or kind of rule-constrained decision model. Uh, and this is a case where the decision maker is constrained to choose in favor of some attribute when that is the only difference between candidates. And you sometimes see in job ads explicitly stated, we will never hire a man over an equally qualified woman. Well, if that characterizes your preferences or it characterizes the rules under which you make choices, then in this vertical choice, you will always pick the woman. But if deep down you prefer men, the rule doesn't say anything about what you should do in the diagonals, and then you will pick the man, and that will exhibit the same intransitive cycle. So that was just intuition. Let's, let me show you the model that we use, which, uh, which kind of captures all of these in different ways. So we're gonna consider a world in which uh, people are making judgments of or choosing between bundles of binary attributes. So there are n different attributes and an attribute can either be one or minus one. So if there were two, then it would be a square. If there were three, we'd be thinking about a cube and, and so on. And you're gonna see lots of these types of pictures throughout the talk. So attributes could be things like male, female, or safe and risky, sooner or later, green and blue, or kind of anything. The utility here is not going to be defined just over the attribute that you're considering, but it's going to be influenced by a comparator. So this is a model of choice set dependent or context dependent preferences. So every time you consider X, there's some other X prime that's going to enter your, uh, your judgment. And so we're going to write the utility function as having this form where uh, it's the utility of X, but it depends on both X and this comparison X prime. Uh, obviously, you could imagine generalizing that to larger comparison sets, but we're going to today focus only on two object comparison sets and two types of decision. The first is going to be joint evaluation, and that's when I show you two bundles and I ask you to report your utility of both of them. So essentially, I explicitly invoke that two object comparison set and say, tell me your utility of the first one and the utility of the second one. That could be through willingness to pay. It could be just through some unincentivized solicitation. Uh, and I'm just going to ima imagine today, let's abstract from incentive issues and say, we have some way of asking people to report both utilities. Uh, and then the, the second type of data we're going to consider is binary choice data, where I give you a two element choice set and I ask you to choose between them. And again, that's going to invoke this comparison between X and X prime. So how does this comparison set enter your preferences? It's gonna enter in a specific way and it's through this object that we call opacity. So opacity is a function and it gives a particular value to each attribute. So it's defined at the level of I, which is the attribute, but it depends on the vector of differences between the bundles. So uh, this is gonna be a vector which takes values either zero or two, depending on whether both attributes have the same value or they both have different values. Uh, and, uh, and in general, the, the opacity of attribute i is going to depend on that whole vector. And now I can introduce this, uh, this definition of an implicit preference. So informally, we're going to say that you have a, a, an implicit preference for attribute i is one that is expressed more strongly when the comparison set is more opaque about that attribute. So when theta i is larger, that implicit preference has more influence on your utility. 
And formally, here's what it looks like. So this is the utility function, and it has two pieces. The first piece is the explicit preferences. These are the, this is just a conventional utility of the bundle. And the second part is the interesting part, which is the implicit preferences. And these are gonna enter additively. Uh, and I'll just walk you through how they work. So for each attribute, you have xi is the value of the attribute. So it's either one or negative one. And then kappa i is the implicit preference for i. So if kappa is positive, that means you implicitly prefer when x is equal to one. And finally, uh, theta is this opacity function. And when theta is larger, it essentially scales up the implicit preference. So the implicit preference has more influence on your utility when theta is higher. So that's the utility function. And now I'm going to tell you a bit about the properties of this opacity function. And it's going to be through an example. So I want you to consider two comparison sets, this horizontal blue one and this diagonal orange one. We're going to say that the diagonal comparison set is more opaque than the horizontal one about the attribute that's varying on the horizontal, about this left-right attribute. Why is that? Well, intuitively, think of the signaling model. In the horizontal choice set, the only thing that's varying here is this horizontal attribute. And so if I choose differently, if I evaluate x and x prime differently, that can be easily attributed to the variation on this axis. Whereas the diagonal comparison set is mixing that horizontal attribute with the vertical one. I can't directly infer what is the weight that you're putting on the horizontal and what is the weight that you're putting on the vertical. So it becomes more opaque about that horizontal attribute. At the same time, this diagonal attribute is less opaque about the vertical dimension. And the reason for that is that this horizontal attribute has no variation on the vertical. So if I observe your choices or, or your evaluations, it's very difficult for me to figure out what role was that particular value on the vertical axis playing in the choice. Whereas when I see the choices or evaluations on this diagonal, well, obviously vertical is mixed with horizontal, but there's some information there about what role that vertical attribute was playing. So the diagonal is less opaque about the vertical dimension. And finally, the diagonal is also less opaque about this depth dimension, this front back. And that's because uh, previously, the depth dimension was, was perfectly correlated with the horizontal. So again, just as it was hard for me to figure out the influence of the horizontal, it was also hard for me to figure out the influence of the depth dimension. And now that correlation is broken. And so I get more information in the diagonal about the depth dimension. So I'm, I'm using this, in, this information and intuition because it, it's kind of helpful to keep in mind, but remember those different foundations work slightly differently. Um, so this is an, a simple example. In general, for any two comparisons, uh, we can rank the opacities for each attribute provided their differences are ordered in a vector sense. So if, uh, if one comparison has a difference on one attribute and one comparison has differences on a different attribute, then I'm not going to be able to rank them. But if, there, if, there's, if I can write a vector inequality that ranks those, uh, those, uh, those differences, then I can rank the opacity. So we're going to get a semi-order. We're going to be able to say, we're going to be able to compare opacity for some comparison sets, but not others. So now we're going to turn to identification. So the goal here is to identify, we're not going to try to identify the values of these implicit preferences. We're going to just try to identify the signs. So is kappa positive or negative? Do I implicitly prefer men or do I implicitly prefer women? And we're going to consider two types of data. We're going to consider joint evaluations. That's where I show you two objects and I ask you to report the value of each of them. And what we're going to be looking for there is something called a scissor. And I'm going to tell you what that is in a second. And then alternatively, I might be looking at binary choices. And then what I'm looking for are these intransitive cycles. So these are going to be the kind of objects of analysis. All right. So given a particular data set, uh, what the theory tells us is that there are two, two things could happen. So you give me a data set of choices or evaluations. The first thing is that I could falsify the model. So we have a theorem for evaluation and a theorem for choice that tells you, essentially, if you observe the following, then the model is falsified. So if I a, a simple example would be, if I observe one set of cycles that implies an implicit preference for men, and I see another set of cycles that implies an implicit preference for women, under the assumption that you can't hold both of those simultaneously, th these choices are generated by something else. That would be a kind of simple case in which we falsify. Um, 
provided those conditions are satisfied, so providing the model is not falsified, that means that the, the, the data can be rationalized by some set of implicit preferences. And then the question is, what are they? And there's, there's uh, three possibilities. One possibility is that given what we observe, we actually can't identify what the implicit preferences are. We can say that the, the model is not rejected, but we don't know what they are. So that could be because we never see any of these cycles or these scissors that we need to see. So there's kind of no information there. Or it could be that what we see is not enough to rule out any, any combination of implicit preferences. The second possibility is that we see a disjunction. That is, we can say, well, this person is either implicitly pro-male or they're implicitly pro-MBA, or possibly both, but we can't distinguish. And finally, kind of the holy grail is to identify something uniquely. Uh, if we see a certain pattern of choices, we can say uh, we're confident that this person is implicitly pro-male or pro-female or pro-MBA or whatever. So you've seen the foundations, you've seen the model. If there are any questions, I can take those now, or otherwise I'll jump straight into evaluation. Cool. So now I'm going to consider that first type of data. This is joint evaluation data. So just to remind you, this is a case where you see the utilities of, uh, of both elements in the comparison set. And what we're going to be interested in here are what we call scissors. And we call them scissors because they look a little bit like a scissor um, cutting something. Uh, and a scissor is a case where we see the same bundle, in this case, a female MBA, evaluated twice in different comparisons. And what we're interested in is how does the utility of this bundle change when the comparator changes? And if it changes in certain systematic ways, we'll be able to identify the implicit preferences over her attributes. So consider this scissor that I've drawn here, uh, and remember our assumptions on opacity, the diagonal comparison set is less opaque about gender than the horizontal one. Why? Because there's no variation in gender in the horizontal one. So if I report a very high or a very low candidate, a very high or a low, very low value, it's hard to tell how much that was influenced by the fact that she's female. At the same time, the diagonal attribute is more opaque about the qualification because now qualification is mixed with gender. I can't distinguish what their separate influences are. So, Suppose we observe that the utility in the diagonal is, is greater than the utility in the horizontal. What can we infer? Well, opacity went up about qualification and the value went up. So that's a positive implicit preference for MBAs. Opacity went down for gender and the value went up. So that would be a negative implicit preference for female or, or kind of conversely, a positive implicit preference for male. So if we observe the utility goes up in the orange comparison set relative to the blue, we infer a disjunction. This person is either implicitly pro-male or implicitly pro-MBA, and we don't know which at this, at this stage. So how do we make progress? Well, what we want to do is to observe multiple of these scissors and combine those disjunctions to identify something uniquely. So if I observe these two, so I observe both the female evaluated twice and the male evaluated twice, against the same comparisons in this particular case, then I would be able to uniquely identify the implicit preference because the first one implies implicit pro-male and or MBA, but the second one implies pro-male and or PhD. It can't be both. So the only, uh, the only thing that can explain these choices here would be an implicit pro-male preference. So we would infer uniquely that this person is implicitly pro-male and we just don't know about the qualification. They could actually be positive or negative or zero. We don't know. So that's the basic intuition here. We're going to look in data on evaluations for these types of scissor patterns. We combine them and see if we can identify uniquely implicit references. Or conversely, maybe they imply a contradiction. Maybe we find someone is both implicit pro-male and implicit pro-female. And then, uh, then we've, we've found a contradiction. Uh, and what the theorem does is basically to generalize this. So it, it takes the full set of scissors in the data and it does exactly what I just described. So I'll skip over that. So let me show you the, uh, this tool in action. So there's a paper by DeSante in the American Journal of Political Science. Uh, and uh, he ran a survey experiment on a representative sample in the US. And the goal of this experiment is to look at whether hard work is rewarded in a colorblind manner. 
So what, what, the, what he does is he shows the participants in the experiment different candidates for state aid, for money from the government. And these candidates are going to vary in their race and as well as in other attributes. And he's interested in whether black people get treated the same as white people. So it seems like a nice setting for applying this approach. So what do people do? They're given a, I just should mention this is all hypothetical choice. They're given a budget for state aid and they divide it between two candidates and the, the remainder can go to offset the state's budget deficit. And, and the majority of people do in, indeed keep something aside for the state. So we're gonna think of this as joint evaluation. Right? They're kind of independently giving a value for applicant one and a value for applicant two. And these applicants basically differ in two respects. So they can differ in their race, it's either black or white, and that's signaled through names like a classic audit study. And they can differ in their work ethic. Some cases it's hidden, and in some cases uh, they can be either excellent or poor. And then there are some other things that vary in the background. We don't actually observe those in the data, but they're counterbalance, and we're going to assume they're neutral from the perspective of implicit preferences. And what we're going to do is examine how the allocations change when the race of the comparator changes. Here's what the experiment looks like. You see these two applicants and you're asked to assign values to each of them. Uh, these are two black uh, candidates, black applicants. So the data set basically allows us to construct three of these double scissor constructions that I was describing. The first we can do uh, is where candidates' work ethic is hidden. So what we observe is a black candidate and their comparator is either black or white. And it's, they're going to differ on some background attributes, but, but the kind of primary variation is race. So we would say this comparison set is, is, is relatively opaque about race. And this orange one is relatively revealing or kind of uh, um, uh, yeah, is less opaque about race. And we're going to say the same for a white candidate evaluated relative to a white relative to a black. So I have my two scissors, the top one and the bottom one. We see the same uh, when the work ethic is reported. We're going to see comparisons between uh, poor work ethic uh, applicants compared to excellent work ethic candidates of different races. We can construct one scissor up here and another scissor down here. And we can also see the other side of the cube uh, with excellent candidates compared against poor. So this is the set that we can construct is, is defined by what's actually in the data, the experimental treatments that DeSante ran. We don't see excellent com candidates compared to excellent candidates in the data, for example. What should we expect to see here if there is implicit racism? Well, those diagonal comparison sets are less opaque about race than the horizontal ones. So if the the person making the decision is implicitly pro-white, they should give a higher evaluation to blacks on the diagonals. Opacity went down, uh, they're implicitly pro-white, which means anti-black, so they should push up uh, on, on the diagonals. So we should see, compared to a horizontal comparison, the blacks should be given more money uh, in the diagonals. And the converse for whites, they should give, they will give a large amount to the whites in the trans, transparent, uh, sorry, in the opaque comparisons. And when opacity decreases, they will give less. So I'm just going to now show you a graph with all of those uh, data points on and walk it through. So I've labeled in the same colors, uh, those horizontals and the verticals. So the blue points here correspond to horizontals. The orange points uh, here correspond to the diagonals. So if we look at the first black uh, scissor, we see that the amount of money awarded went up in the diagonal, consistent with uh, implicit pro-white attitudes. And we see here for the white applicant, the other way around, when the, the, uh, the amount of money awarded went down in the diagonal, just as we predicted. And actually we see that pattern in all but one of these comparisons. So this one goes in the wrong direction. Everything else is moving in the direction of implicit pro-white preferences. So you can probably also see that none of these are individually significant apart from, I think, this one. But we can run a joint test across those, and we find kind of some evidence of, uh, uh, of weak uh, kind of implicit racism in the sense that, uh, that these are systematically not the same. A, we find a significant difference between these valuations, and they just tend to shift consistently in the direction of implicit pro-white attitudes. So that's it for evaluation. 
If there's no questions at this point, I'll jump straight into choice. Yes, I think you can go ahead because Tom is answering a lot of questions in the chat. Cool, thanks, Tom. Typing furiously. So uh, the the other branch, as I said, is uh, is choice data. So one way to think about choice data is it's a kind of censored form of evaluation data. In evaluations, we observe both utilities. In choice data, we just observe which one is larger than the other. Uh, and our, so we can't do this scissor comparison where we say, did the utility go up or down as we change the comparison? But what we can do instead is look for inconsistencies revealed in intransitive cycles. Now, probably many of you are familiar with the idea that actually finding intransitivities in choice data is not straightforward. Um, there's kind of a, a, a long literature discussing this issue. Um, we're gonna choose to focus on choices where we expect ex ante that the decision maker should be close to indifferent. And that's reflected in the examples that I showed you. I, I wasn't showing you uh, a, a woman with a high school diploma and a man with a PhD. Um, we, we tend to, we've been using examples where people seem to be close to, we should expect people to be close to indifferent. And there's two reasons for that. The first is a purely statistical motivation, which is that uh, detecting transitivities is hard, uh, one way to think about that in our framework is suppose the explicit preferences are very strong because I pick candidates that are just very, very different. One is very much better than the other. Then those strong explicit preferences will conceal the implicit preferences. It will be very hard to get an implicit preference that's strong enough to reverse uh, the, the choices that we see. So that's it. statistically, it'll just be difficult to find intransitive preferences if we pick choices where the preferences are very strong. And the second reason comes from the theory so that signaling model that I only hand waved about at the beginning of the talk, for, for evaluation, um, it's quite flexible, but for choice, we need an additional assumption. And in particular, what we need is that the observer expects the decision maker to be indifferent. And just to give you a little intuition as to why, um, consider this decision here. So I've argued that this, this diagonal choice here is more opaque about your gender preferences than the vertical one. Here, if I choose a, a man, it's obvious that it's because he's a man. Here, it might be because the guy has a PhD. Now suppose that instead of MBA candidates here, we have Nobel Prize winners. And suppose you see somebody hiring a man over a female Nobel Prize winner. You probably conclude that this guy doesn't want to hire women. Uh, and so this would be a case in which actually so some choices on these kind of these diagonal, these opaque uh, choice sets actually reveal much more about the motives than the, uh, than the verticals. So that's why we, we kind of need to focus on cases where we think we're near to indifference. Our first uh, kind of unit of analysis, the first thing that we might look at in choice data is what we call a right triangle. So this would be an example of a right triangle. Uh, where we see the female MBA is chosen over the male MBA, who's chosen over the male PhD, and then back again. So what's going on here? Well, the diagonal comparison here is more opaque than the vertical one about gender, because in the diagonal, gender is mixed with qualification. It's the same intuition I've been using over and over again. The diagonal comparison here is also more opaque than the horizontal one about qualification, for the exact same reason, that on the, on the horizontal axis, the only difference is in the qualification, whereas on the diagonal, qualification is mixed with gender. So here I see somebody picking the female over the male in the, uh, in the, the transparent choice, but they switch to picking the male in the opaque choice. So that could reflect an implicit preference for men. Here I see somebody picking the MBA in the transparent choice and switching to picking the PhD in the opaque, uh, so in the trans, in the opaque choice. So that could reflect an implicit preference for PhDs. So just like with our single scissor, we get a disjunction. Uh, this cycle could be generated by an implicit pro male preference, or an implicit pro PhD preference, or possibly both. We can't distinguish between those uh, just with this observation. And then just like with evaluation, if I observe multiple of these triangles then uh, I may be able to reveal a unique implicit preference uh, by kind of cancelling out the disjunctions. So if I find another triangle, which was implicit pro-male or implicit MBA, 
I would conclude, well, uh, it can't be both pro MBA and pro PhD. So the so what's left is that this person is implicitly pro male. But the example I showed you at the beginning wasn't a triangle. It was this uh, this picture here. And this is what we call a figure eight. And in some sense, we think this captures the core intuition of the idea. So what we see here is that in the, the direct choices, which are only varying in gender, we hire the female. And in those indirect, more opaque choices, they hire the male. So I think we already have the intuition for why you might switch from female to male in the diagonals if, you're, if you have this kind of this uh, implicit preference that favors men. We also want to rule out that it could be a, based on the qualifications. And um, Tom and I actually had some discussion today about the most intuitive way to describe this. For me, the, the most intuitive way is to essentially walk your way around the cycle. So as you walk around the cycle, these implicit preferences are coming in uh, in positive or negative ways uh, and, and potentially affecting your choice. And the thing to notice is that in the verticals, uh, the, any implicit preference that you have for qualification will just cancel out based because of the structure of the utility function. Whereas on the diagonals, uh, well, if you have an implicit preference for PhDs, that will give you a positive boost in this choice and a negative boost of exactly the same size in this choice. So as you walk your way around the cycle, you get a positive, uh, kind of positive push as you come down this diagonal and then you get a negative push as you come down here and, and you can't get the cycle to complete. So if you write down the list of inequalities, it will not, it will not add up. So essentially any, any attitude towards MBAs or PhDs will just cancel out uh, and you won't get an intransitive cycle. Uh, so what we would conclude if we observed a single figure eight cycle like this is that this person has an implicit pro-male preference. And again, for qualification, we just don't know. Uh, just a couple more examples. So the theorem that we have actually says for any cycle, we can distinguish um, if it's consistent with the theory and if so, what it allows us to infer about the implicit preferences. This would be an example where we know there's something going on, but we can't tell which implicit preferences are generating it. And this would be an example which is actually incompatible with the theory. So there is no implicit preference that can generate this cycle. So I think I have seven minutes left or something like that. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about Christine Exley's beautiful paper. So what uh, Exley does is she's studying the use of risk as an excuse not to give. And uh, the basic idea, uh, she actually has diagrams uh, that are fairly kind of intuitively similar in her paper. The basic idea is that consider a lottery for charity that you're essentially indifferent to a safe payment that's given to charity. And the same for self, there's, there's some lottery for self and I'm indifferent between that lottery and a safe payment for myself. But when I make a comparison between the lottery for charity and a safe payment for myself, I start to look more risk averse. And when I make a comparison between a safe amount to charity and a lottery for myself, I start to look more risk loving. And so uh, there's this intuitive sense that this is revealing that you would really like to give things to yourself uh, and you can do so by, in some sense, distorting your risk preferences. Um, actually, what's really nice about this paper is that the analysis we end up doing, you won't see it because I'm, I don't have time to show you in all the, all the guts and detail. The analysis we end up doing is very, very similar to what Christine does. We just arrive there in a different way. Um, I think the main distinction is that she kind of looks at average certainty equivalence, and we're going to be classifying individual choices and individual decision makers. So in a little more detail, what she does is she elicits an amount X X dollars for charity that's just preferred to $10 for yourself. And she uses that to calibrate a whole load of choice lists. And the choice lists have structures like this. So there'll be a lottery for charity that pays X, and there'll be a lottery for myself that pays 10 with some probability. And those will be compared to monetary amounts, again, either for myself or for charity. And everything's calibrated off of that X choice at the beginning. And you see choices between charity, charity, self and self, self, charity, and charity self. So exactly the kind of data that we would like to see for our analysis. There's seven different lottery pairs defined by seven different probabilities. And we never see direct choices between probabilities. So all the analysis we do is kind of segregated 
within the choices over 5% lotteries, within the choices over 10% lotteries, and so forth. So this isn't a binary attribute space just yet. There's variation in money, there's variation in probability and in recipient. We need to do a transformation. Um, what we, I won't show you today, but the, the design and the assumptions that Exley makes actually naturally maps into a binary representation. So we can pick particular choices out of those choice lists that fit nicely into this binary representation. And we essentially observe preferences, uh, we observe choices on these four uh, lines. So two horizontals and two diagonals. So given that, with no further assumptions, we can start to look for something that Exley doesn't uh, formally analyze, which is implicit risk attitudes. Essentially, what we can see here is one of two figure eight patterns. So I can see a figure eight where I choose risky payments on the horizontals. These are the choices which are kind of transparently about risk. And then I choose safer, uh, I choose, uh, safer payments on the diagonals. This is a choice where risk is mixed with recipient. So it's somehow more opaque as to what role the risk, the risk is taking. So this person, they choose safety on the more opaque choices. So we would say they're implicitly pro-safety, or we could say implicitly risk averse. If we saw the opposite cycle, we would infer implicit risk-seeking behavior. They become more risk-loving on these diagonals. This is entirely different to kind of self or uh, pro-charity attitudes. This is, this is just about the risk dimension. So we can go and look in the data and see if anyone is doing this. Um, each participant can exhibit up to seven of these cycles. And in principle, they could do some risk seeking and some risk averse. And then we would conclude this person is not consistent with that theory. So I made a heat map that plots the different uh, people, essentially, what they're doing. So uh, along the horizontal axis is the number of implicitly risk averse figure eights you exhibit. And along the vertical axis is the number of implicitly risk seeking figure eights. So the most mass is here at zero. So the, the modal uh, person doesn't exhibit any of these intransitive cycles. But we, we do see some mass both spreading out along this axis and along this axis. And then there's a few people here. These are the people that are inconsistent. They do a bit, a bit risk seeking and a bit risk averse. And if I was to classify people, so th there's a question as to how strict should we be in classifying people? Do we, is one figure eight enough to classify them? I'm just gonna say that that is for today. Um, if we take a classification based on at least one cycle, what we find is that about 45% of people look consistent, about 30% of them look implicitly risk averse, about 15% look implicitly risk seeking, and then around 10% are uh, inconsistent. And then finally, uh, we're going to do the same thing that Christine Exley does. We're going to look at selfishness. And it, it's perhaps surprising that just these choice data alone actually don't reveal your implicit pro-self or pro-charity attitudes. Because what we actually would need is to see what you choose on these vertical axes. And those aren't included in the choice list that she studies. So she doesn't ask people to make direct choices between the lotteries or direct choices between lots of different safe payments. She just has that one at the beginning, that calibration choice. But she's aware of this and she actually makes a, a reasonable assumption, which is that your preferences are kind of approximately linear over this trade-off between self and charity. So if you prefer $20 for charity over 10 for self, then we infer that you'll also prefer $10 for charity over five for self. And under that assumption, I'm able to fill in these vertical preferences. We can essentially impute what you would have chosen. And you also need to assume probabilities are separable uh, from, risk, from payoffs. Uh, and once I've imputed those, I can see a figure eight. And in particular, the figure eight I can see is one that is uh, implicitly pro-self. So I choose selfishly on these diagonals and I choose pro-charity on the verticals. And because the choices are calibrated off of a choice where, remember this X is bigger than 10, so the X is preferred to 10. So I can see a preference for charity over self on this axis. I can never see the other way around. So I actually can't, I can't see implicit pro-charity figure eights in this data set. If we use that uh, classification, I've just put the whole data here we see kind of consistent with what Exley finds that a huge fraction of participants look implicitly selfish. It's close to 80% of them exhibit this uh, inconsistency where they favor themselves when, when they can. And so that's it. Uh, so what I've shown you today, what we've argued is that 
that there are many theories that feature this tension between two kinds of motives, these explicit versus implicit, or you might say signaling versus intrinsic or conscious, unconscious, and so on. And we've argued that you can formalize that, that idea into this kind of general model uh, of implicit preferences that are those that become stronger and more opaque settings, and we can identify them in decisions. And we think it's a promising approach. Uh, we think there are actually very broad applications. I've just listed a few here. Uh, I won't read them all out, but uh, we've also highlighted a few recent papers that, that have kind of similar intuition looking at different domains like implicit discrimination, implicit present bias or patience and so on. Um, but that's, that's all I have to say for today. So uh, happy to open up for Q&A. Great, thank you very much. Um, so we had a lively discussion in the chat. Um, if uh, let me actually give you the chance to unmute yourself. Um, so now we can uh, either uh, uh, bring up some of the questions from the chat or let you ask your own questions uh, to John and Tom. So either raise your hand or just unmute yourself and uh, speak up or whatever you feel more comfortable doing. We have around 10 minutes. So one question that uh, um, Tom has been answering in the chat has to do with uh, extending this beyond binary comparisons. Mm -hmm. um, maybe this is of interest to more people. Can you say something? Uh, out loud. Uh, what did Tom say? I don't want to contradict him. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say we've explored it in great detail. Is that fair, Tom? Um, yes, I want to say so in the in the in the response, I said there's two there's two ways in which the model is binary. There's binary attributes and there's binary choice sets. And I wasn't I answered, uh, I tried to say something about both in the response. Right. Right. Yeah, the binary attributes. Um, we do sometimes, sometimes you have continuous attribute space, like in the Exley, where probability and, and money continuous. It turns out that you can reduce that to a binary space. We found sufficient assumptions where if you um, if you have uncertainty about the degree of risk aversion and the degree of pro-charity preferences, and those are the two um, random variables, which, for example, in the signaling model you're trying to infer, then you can actually show that her um, choice choice sets either identify one or the other or both, and right. so you can you can rewrite it in a binary space. So there are tricks. I want to say that that's not a you can't you will always not reduce a continuous exactly. Um, it has to yeah, be actually, we got so lucky. So if she was using more complex lotteries, so with multiple probabilities, so I don't think it would be possible to do this reduction, for example. Mm -hmm. So then we would. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. yeah. It's a bit of a case by case whether you can reduce the right. continuous space to a binary space. Yep. Um, the other thing that I said in the in the thread was regarding binary choice sets. If you think about you know choice from three elements, I think uh, the 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 short answer is this: is that um, you could extend the definition of implicit preferences to that, but it's going to lose. Um, some of the elegance of it because the three different foundations, implicit knowledge, signaling, and, uh, and um, ceteris paribus, each going to give different implications about what happens in choice sets which have more than two elements, which have three elements, so that there's no longer a sort of domain general or foundation general um, definition, behavioral definition, implicit preferences, right. which can encompass all those different things. But actually, once you observe people choosing from three choice sets, it depends on the particular structure of what's going on in the head. Right. And I guess the flip side of that is that that might be one way to try to distinguish between foundations if that's important. Um, one question I had that to do with the opacity um, function. So I understand that's uh, attribute specific if you have more than, than two attributes and does it also, um, does the argument of that uh, function change with the attribute? Like every other attribute contributes to forming the opacity of this attribute. So I didn't understand how could they be different uh, for different attributes if they take the same input. So if we just take this example, I mean, the, the input is, the, is just the set of differences that you see right. between the elements of the choice set. So 
if we compare the vertical to the diagonal, there's we differ in one case here, and we differ in two cases here. And the fact that uh, that risk is varying on this dimension makes charity more opaque uh, on this on this uh, in the diagonal. And that's the sense in which they all depend on each other. So risk is now mixed with charity. So adding variation to the risk dimension changes uh, how opaque uh, your choices are about the vertical dimension. And as you contrast, there are some kind of uh, a bunch of recent models of context specific choice, like these range dependent models. And often mm -hmm. what's going on there is that actually it's, it's the range on the attribute under consideration that matters. Right, that's uh, what I had in mind, yes. Whereas here it's more about the whole relationship between Got all it. the attributes. Okay, okay. So it's uh, uh, the whole set of differences that affects the opacity, yeah. not the one on, yeah. not the attribute specific difference. Okay, thanks. Um, can I ask a question? Go ahead, Alexandros. Um, so uh, I guess a lot of your results rely on the assumption of, like as Tom said, of like ceteris paribus, right? So if I am biased, I'm biased towards a particular way uh, implicitly. Uh, can you, how could you actually check if there is no something weird interaction between attributes, right? That would not right. have- so You mean the, 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 the function is linear, isn't it? Is linear and separable right. in the references. Right. I'll run all the way back there. Uh, da, 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 da. Here, it's this summation that you're concerned about. Thanks, Andres. How could we check? Uh, I mean, what I'm saying is that, do you have any any hunch that this is something mm. that actually holds? That, that, that actually it's reasonable to think of these implicit attitudes as being separable, is that what you mean? Yeah. I mean, I think when Tom and I discuss these things, we maybe come from different perspectives. I always incline to think of a first order approximation of the world that like maybe there are some interactions, but the first order effect is that gender is varying and not uh, gender times qualification. Um, I'm sure it's, I'm sure you can come up with cases where we think it's reasonable that people particularly care about men with MBAs or something like that. So I wouldn't want to say that this is a property of the universe. Um, <laughs> But mm. with many attributes, that might be a bit more uh, hidden, right? Mm. Um, I feel I would say it's the classic problem of modeling someone's utility function that you have this trade-off that you can be incredibly fine-grained, but then you have zero external validity, right? If you take in every single, if everything is an argument for utility function, you can make no extrapolations. Whereas if you say the utility is just over consumption, you can make a lot of extrapolations, but the utility function is wrong, right? And that, and that I think that the same is true here. We're going to make this assumption that you implicit preference is separable, which sometimes is going to be right and sometimes it's going to be wrong. But there's a sort of a priori reason to think that people are much more likely to have pro-male or pro-female implicit preferences than to have male PhD, you know, specific just to male PhDs. You see what I'm saying? So it is a it's it becomes non-falsifiable if you if you allow implicit preferences to be specific to a single outcome, then it, it's completely unfalsifiable. It has no empirical content, um, and I think that's just an, the normal trade off utility functions. As you make it more and more fine grained, it becomes less and less falsifiable. Uh, One can, could think, for example, of preferences that I would not like to hire an empowered woman, for example, right? That might be some indication, maybe the education could be indicative of something. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And one other quick reaction on that is that we think there are some cases where you may a priori rule out certain dimensions. So you may just say, you know, I, you know what, I don't think that there are implicit preferences over degrees or qualifications, but I do want to check if there are implicit preferences over gender. Uh, uh, and that would be a case where that disjunction that we found from the triangle was actually enough to identify something uniquely. Um, so it kind of goes in the other direction. That's saying actually it depends on even less than on, on more, but uh, 
Colin has a question. Yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's more of a um, praise. Uh, since the question cadence seems to be slowing down, we just have a couple minutes. One, th one reason I love this paper is, um, I think it illustrates two things. One is, if you have a really big grand idea, you're basically way ahead of the field. You can afford to take your time. <laughs> Tom, I think knows what I mean, maybe John. Um, anyway, um, so that's just sort of a, so, so for those who work on wild ideas, there may be a lot of risk, scientific risk in what you're doing, but um, no one is going to scoop you. The second thing is, there's a, there's a kind of dimension that most of us are often looking for in our research, um, which you, th you could think of as like fruitfulness. You know, so in some ways, this paper is a paper that has substance and, and interesting organizing principles and um, illust the illustrations are just perfect, right? Just perfect. But if you look at the last slide, maybe you could, can toggle to the last one, John, if yeah. you can. This is a grant proposal, right? For, mm. you know, you, you could think of like 50 papers that would come out of this. And like the one that we discussed in the chat and Tom mentioned, which is if you go to three options, I, I think you were sounding like it's almost kind of a bug, but if you go to three options rather than two or more than three, suddenly what the theory say depends upon whether it's signaling or whether it's rule following. That's great, right? That's, mm. I mean, it, you, you lose some unification of the structure obviously, but now you have three, you have three types of papers you can write, or if there's controversy in the literature about whether a pattern is due to something like rule following versus signaling, you, you have a method to, Figure, adjudicate. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, I just wanted to flag, especially for students and people who are either um, early in tenure or early in grad school, and you, you have a chance to really think big. This is a good example of where a paper scores kind of off the charts on this sort of fruitfulness. Like do you, at the end, do you think, wow, I can't w w wait, wait to read more of this research program, whether it's from, from you or, or other people who are inspired? By it. like even the very last thing on this list, framing effects as an implicit preference. Framing effects have been around for ages. The original idea kind of comes from um, visual illusions, and we still don't really deeply understand them. Mm. Uh, so new ideas are welcome, even on something something that's such an old and familiar um, topic. Anyway, that's my more of a comment than a question. Not going to complain about that. <laughs> Thank you, Good. Colin. It's Thank lovely. You. I'm tempted to close with uh, Colin's comment. Uh, there is one unanswered question from the chat, so let me uh, raise it. But thank you, Colin, uh, for mm -hmm. bringing this perspective, broader perspective, to the presentation by by Gabriel. Um, would one way to understand the relationship between implicit preference and intransitive preference lies in failures to inhibit your implicit preferences? In other words, you try to mimic socially acceptable preferences that sometimes fail to do so. What would be your hypothesis for this relationship? I guess it depends on how systematic the sometimes is. So um, you can think of the, one way to think of the, this implicit association or implicit knowledge framework, uh, the middle one is that, that you, you're in conflict between what you kind of your gut instincts tell you to, to do and what you also think is right or that you should do. And there are some times when you catch yourself and there are some times when you don't. Um, it's a systematic uh, form of that. Um, if it's just that sometimes I fail to do what's right, I, I guess you would need to pose a reason why that would go up in a more opaque decisions. Okay, thank you. So uh, it's uh, 6 p.m. here in Milan, so our time is up. But thank you very much uh, for a great presentation. Thank you for a lively discussion. Um, we are meeting again in two weeks on March 30th with Dorothea Kubler. And at that point, uh, we will be back in sync with the US with uh, daylight saving time. Thank you, everybody, and uh, hope to see you in, uh, in two weeks. Thanks so much. <laughs>